you know, when I started on my, my self work journey a couple years ago, I think when you first get into it, it's all about your mindset, right? Mm -hmm. I'm working on my mindset or I'm reading these books about mindset. I'm taking this course about, uh, business mindset or success mindset or money mindset, right? But it goes so much deeper than that. Hello and welcome to episode 31 of the Living and Leading with Emotional Intelligence podcast. I'm your host, Brittany Nicole. Feels odd saying episode 31 when our last traditional podcast interview recording was episode 23. Um, but here we are back to our bi weekly traditional interview format. I hope you've been enjoying the new format of daily releases with daily themes. But today, let's get back to it. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to Grace Johnston. Grace and I connected over Facebook. She reached out wondering if she could share her story on the podcast. And after reading a post that she wrote on Facebook about changing all three of her names, that's right, all three, and the reason behind that decision, I was really intrigued to learn more. So we hopped on a call. The call was amazing. And I wanted Grace to bring that story and her insight to the podcast so in this podcast, she talks about why she made the decision to change all three of her names, but she also provides some amazing nuggets about self-development and developing a sense of awareness and introspection and understanding the t intent behind why we do what we do. You can learn more about Grace in the show notes for today, but today Grace is a confidence coach and a Pilates instructor here in North Carolina. Now, in the beginning of this episode, I just want to throw this out there. We talk about take three, or I talk about take three. This is the original recording. Take three means that in the beginning, there were some hiccups with Zoom. And so I was constantly like trying to do the introduction and things are kind of going a little haywire on my end. So this is, again, the one and only recording of this podcast episode. So without further ado... Here it is, and here's Grace Johnson. <laughs> All right, <laughs> here we go. Take three. <laughs> All right, Grace. Well, welcome to the Living and Leading with Emotional Intelligence podcast. It's a pleasure to have you. I really appreciate you reaching out to me, but uh, I read your post on Facebook, and it intrigued me, first off. It was very interesting. And I want to learn more because when you and I connected a few weeks ago and actually met and talked, we didn't really get into the nitty gritty of the whole name change in your past. And listeners, well, you'll understand what I'm talking about with the name change later on to this episode. But before we get into that, um, Grace, I would love for you to introduce yourselves to our listeners and viewers. Okay, awesome. So uh, I'm Grace Johnston. I recently changed my name away from Gabrielle Grace. I work as a confidence coach and Pilates instructor here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and I have a wonderful husband and a pit bull named Stella and two lovely cats. And I've been an entrepreneur for about eight years now. So that's kind of the, the short version of, of who I am. Uh, but I am delighted to be here with you, Brittany. Super excited to have you. So yeah, as, as we, you know, in our take two of this for the first few minutes, um, I was talking about your name that was showing up in the Zoom meeting and it was your old name. So you change all three of your names, your first, middle, and last name. And in your post, you talk about the background of each of those names and the significance of why you decided to make that change. Can you kind of talk about that and, and start with each of the names? And there was a lot of stories behind each of those names. So I would, I would love for you to kind of share that because you have really transitioned um, through 
the years and really found yourself. And that was one thing that I loved in our one-on-one discussion together. Yeah. yeah. So that's a, that's a recent change for me. So I literally just did this um, about a month ago, actually, I think it was uh, four weeks from last weekend. And I just um, had spent a lot of time working on myself and uh, trying to really work through some trauma and some old baggage, old programming, uh, really for the last two years. And I feel like I've evolved a lot as a person. And so about a month ago, I just, I was having my coffee and eating breakfast and I was just sitting on my sofa and it just came to me. Um, I think I need to change my name. And it was almost like somebody was talking to me and I was like, wait a minute, what, like, what do you mean change your name? And, and what would I change it to? So I was having this like inner dialogue with myself Mm -hmm. about what do you mean? I need to change my name. And it really, it just, the more I kind of pulled the thread of like, where is this coming from? And what does this mean? Um, the more sense it made to me. So, um, I wrote a really long Facebook post um, about it that lots of people saw. And I, I always tell people, I kind of like dumped my purse in the parking lot about it. <laughs> like, I just really like, yeah. um, hear all the things and like really behind each first middle and last name, there were kind of pieces of things that had been assigned to me that didn't feel right anymore. Um, they just didn't feel like me. And I was just really at this point where I felt like the new me is kind of like exploding out of the old me. Like I'm, I'm tearing out (laughs) of my old identity. And, um, so yeah, I'll take a little bit of time to explain. Uh, my former name was Gabrielle Marie Grace and, uh, my first name you know, it was chosen by my parents, obviously. Uh, they were not great as a couple. They had a pretty emotionally abusive relationship. And um, at the time, they were both very, very Catholic. And we were living in France. And uh, as over the years, you know, I moved away from Catholicism and and identifying that as my um my spiritual identity. Uh, I haven't lived in France since I was 14. So that was, you know, a great, wonderful experience and time in my life. Um, But I I no longer identify as being French. And um, I really just felt like I'm just not a Gabrielle anymore. And that was kind of how this whole thing started was like, I just sort of decided I don't really like my first name anymore, even though it's who I've always been. Right. And, you know, it was a little bit of a mouthful for people um, in France and in the States. People always had trouble pronouncing it. People had trouble spelling it. Um, So since I was, since I turned about eight years old, I was always Gabby. It was always Gabby for short, because that's, that's easier for people. Yeah. And I'm just really at a point in my life where I'm like, I don't care if who I am is easy for people. (laughs) So that was a big light bulb. And then I I just always felt like Marie, my middle name was a little useless. I didn't really sort of felt like it was a a bit of a filler. Um, Didn't really identify with it. No one else in my family has that name. And then for the, the cherry on top, which is the big one, my last name, I also decided to change, which has a little bit more of a backstory behind it. So my father decided to change his name from O'Keefe, which is our family name, to Grace after he ended his first marriage in which he had four children. He left that marriage Uh, left those four kids and then decided to move to France with my mother. And so to be honest with you, that last name 
has always been kind of full of abandon and betrayal for me. I always kind of felt like the bad seed in the family Mm -hmm. because I was the last kid and the one who took dad away from everybody else. And it was also very alienating for me because it wasn't a family name. And when my parents got divorced, um, it really was just uh, my father and I sharing that last name and we no longer had a relationship. So I really just felt like I came from this family, but I was all alone and somehow it was all my fault that those kids got left behind. And really as I've grown, grace to me means something completely different. And it really comes down to what I had to give myself in order to thrive and then survive. Mm -hmm. And it is what I've always given myself and um, just being, being kind and compassionate to myself first so that I could be kind and compassionate with those people around me. Um, That's what grace means to me. Yeah. Um, So, and I had a a couple really good friends who just called me grace. They didn't call me Gabrielle. They didn't call me Gabby. They always just called me grace. And it just always kind of gave me the, the warm fuzzies, if you will. So that just felt like the right thing for me was to take, my last name and make it my first name. Wow. Uh, So many things that like, I just want to expand upon. So I'm, I'm really curious. um, Have you had any contact or have you ever reached out to your, your half siblings at all? Has that ever been something that you felt the urge to do and, And if so, how did that go? And if not, you know, how do you feel about, about where that stands with you? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, I had the urge to reach out to my siblings, um, in early adulthood. So late teens, early twenties, and and then throughout my twenties, I did have times where there are two in particular that I was closer to. And I, I really felt the need to, to, to propagate that relationship, to maintain it and to develop it. But to be honest with you, I always, I always felt like there was this heavy blame. Mm-hmm. Like I was, I was convicted of a crime at a very early age for what happened to those kids. And You know, it's really after years and years of introspection that I decided I don't need this blame anymore and I don't need this shame. And um, I'm at a point in my life and I am the kind of person who is deserving of mutually empowering relationships. And unfortunately, my relationships with my siblings have not been such. Right. Um, so I totally tried to pursue those relationships and make them work. I'm just at a point where, you know, if a relationship doesn't feel nurturing to me because I am such a nurturer, then I, I just cut the cord, um, Mm -hmm. and just leave it as is, um, because I do have a a tremendous tendency to overgive, uh, and that's not always in my best interest. Right, right. And that's where emotional intelligence comes in on both sides. So I think about you reaching out to your siblings and you, you saying that there was that heavy weight that you felt like of blame still there. And so that's kind of their lack of awareness and introspection of realizing where that blame comes from and how they're attaching that to you in a very unjust, we tend to shoot the messenger, as we say, um, or blame people that are not the, the root cause of an issue. And I think that is so unfortunate, but then emotional intelligence on your part, where once you realize that, and you said to yourself, you know, I tried to make this work, but it's not serving me. And this is not healthy for me. Then 
you, you were able to kind of cut that cord and move on and have that acceptance for what is right. Yeah. Absolutely. And with, and with this name change, you know, I, I tell people that when you make a transition like that, a self evolu- a self evolution, so to speak, you are rewriting the script of your life because you are getting rid of all these social scripts and indoctrinations that have been attached to your identity for all these years. And you are quite literally rewriting the script for your life by changing all of your names, right? You, you really rewrote that script. I think it's amazing that over the past two years, you've done so much, um, work on yourself because for me, it took, you know, seven years. And obviously we're all still continuing to work on ourselves, but from speaking to you a few weeks ago, I know that you're way ahead of where I was at two years. And it seems like you've experienced far more trauma than I ever have, um, which is interesting to me. So how did you go about, I'd be curious about, you know, when you decided to have that self-compassion, because you talked about self-compassion for yourself, how did you come to that realization? And what were the first steps that you took in your journey to self-evolution? Well, I think, um, you know, I, I pretty much spent my whole life kind of living this like hamster wheel lifestyle of just work harder so you can keep surviving and keep working harder and just do that over and over and over again. Yeah. And I really, there have been a lot of times in my life, childhood and adult, where I, I was in a really shitty high pressure situation and I had to pull myself up by my bootstraps. And I think I, I had an opportunity in the last two years to slow down and to really deeply check in with myself. And that, uh, you know, kind of opened a Pandora's box of things that I really didn't want to deal with, but, but really core, deep wounds that I needed to take the time to acknowledge and to heal. And I think that has made me feel um, complete as a person. And it has allowed me to experience wholeness and fullness in a way that I would not have otherwise done. Yeah. So to answer your question, for me, self-compassion was about slowing down and about um, giving myself, you know, what I called a, a golden hour every morning. That's just um, whatever you need to do for yourself. You need to um, you need to stretch, you need to exercise, you need to hydrate, you need to make a list of the things that you're grateful for so you can feel centered and like your head is in a good place. It was all sorts of different things, but I think um, being really hardcore about showing up to slow down for myself every day, even in the beginning, it was just an hour a day, that really, really opened me up. And what I mean by that is that it opened me up to to feel more deeply and to experience joy at a level that I had not been able to before that. What advice would you give to someone who is at that point in their life where they feel like something's got to give? I'm absolutely miserable, yet they're terrified of having to face those truths because that's, that's the hardest part, right? That's a big hurdle to overcome. But once you do, as we had discussed, it's liberating, but it's hard to see that because you don't know what you don't know. You've only experienced that part of your life, that trauma, that misery. So it's like, what does that even feel like to be liberated from that? So what advice would you give them in the beginning stages? Well, I would say the very first thing that you can do um, with small steps and just a little bit at a time is just to find some empowered ways to say no. So do you have um, 
social commitments or household chores or work tasks is that what can you let go of? So, so what in your life doesn't really light you up that you're just doing because you said you would or because you have to or because you really should? Um, what are some commitments that you have or some activities or obligations that are not energizing that you can let go of? Because I think the very first step is to just give yourself some space, but you don't just get that space. You have to create some space and some room. And oftentimes that really does start with your schedule of how can you take an extra 20 to 30 minutes for yourself first thing in the morning. And I think the other piece of it really is if you've got some hard experiences that you're, um, that you're not acknowledging as trauma, my, my primary advice is don't try to eat the elephant in one bite (laughs) because Mm -hmm. it can, I mean, I think a big part of the avoidance is, well, that could take years. I don't have time to do that. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I I remember that with so many things in my life, like the time that it was going to take, like I wanted to learn how to play a musical instrument but then I'm like, oh, but that's going to take years to be able to master that. Or I want to learn another language. That's going to take years to master that. I want to anything, higher education, whatever it was. And then 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, you look back and say, oh my gosh, I could have mastered that if I would have just started then. We look at how much time it's going to be to master it. But then we don't look at, well, if I don't start, then I'm never going to get there. Yeah, no, absolutely. So backwards. It's very backwards. We see things from from a loss perspective too, right? Instead of what we have to gain. It's like, well, I don't want to lose that time spending, you know, time meditating or doing this. Like I've got too much to do. I can't afford to lose that time. But then we don't see what we have to gain from- transforming that time into something more productive and beneficial for us. Well, we say productive and beneficial. I mean, I think um, for people who are like hardcore um, type A, like achievement driven people like myself and present company included, um, you know, people who have had to hustle for anything um, have, they have drive, they have ambition, they feel like Um, They feel good about themselves when they achieve things, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And there's nothing wrong with being that way. But I do think, you know, for those people, a really good place to start is a book like uh, The Happiness Advantage by Sean Acker, which is um, empirical scientific evidence of how being happier actually makes you way more productive and way more prolific and way more likely to get raises and make more money. What's that other book? The, uh, is it the body keeps the score or something? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, there is scientific evidence out there and, you know, I would challenge people to, to look and, you know, when you see somebody, driving a really nice car or living in a really nice house, are they blue in the face because they're working 80 and 90 hours a week? Or are they, um, you know, just coming home from a two hour workout and, you know, like what is their lifestyle like exactly? Because people don't get to the top by running themselves ragged, right? The people who have like done things that we aspire to achieve usually have a a healthier and more balanced lifestyle than we do. Um, Sometimes. 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 Not all the time. But I I do think um, for me, I have discovered that hyper productivity and hyper creativity come from uh, what I call extreme self-care. So it's like, forget the you need 30 to 60 minutes a day of exercise, um, ask yourself instead, what do I need to give myself in order to show up as the person that I would like to become? 
because there are always things that we are not giving ourselves in order to show up in a big juicy way. So what are some examples of things that we need to give ourselves? Cause some people may take that as, Oh, I need to go on a shopping spree. <laughs> I just want to clarify that because some people, you know, that's their focus. This is what I need to get myself or have or do to. You're right. Yeah. That that is a huge trap. Um, I like to think of (laughs) self-love. I'm going to take the whole umbrella, uh, self-love as things that feel good today and tomorrow. Right. Because drinking a bottle of wine might feel great Mm -hmm. today. Yeah probably not going to feel good tomorrow. Uh, Going on a huge shopping spree and spending beyond your means might feel good in the moment. It's not going to feel good tomorrow. So, um, you know, for me, exercise first thing in the day is crucial um, because I am a major bitch without it. (laughs) And it really does. um, The more I give to myself, physically, mentally, emotionally, uh, energetically, or spiritually, if you will, um, the more I get into sort of a hyperproductive state where I really can um, knock out an entire day's work in less than a couple hours. And I think most people just have these crazy expectations of, you know, I just need to work harder. And yeah. well, making money is hard. So of course, that just means I'm not working, working hard enough. Um, but it is absolutely, you can't buy your way into the life that you want. It really is all about who are you becoming. Um, and in order to have that integrity and that power, you really do need to spend a lot of fucking time with yourself. You have to like really spend time with yourself. And most people avoid the hell out of that. And I really did. For years, I avoided spending time alone with my thoughts because I thought that's a dark place and I don't want to go there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And everything that you mentioned about giving that to yourself, you said emotionally, spiritually, physically, things like that. None of that has anything to do with monetary value or worth or things. It's not materials. It's things that you can do if you are thrown in the middle of a deserted, you know, landscape, you still have those things with you. It comes from the inside, not from the outside. And I think our society, one of those major scripts that have just been hammered into us from a very young age is that we need things to make us happy because we bring those memories from birthdays and holidays where we were gifted things and how happy we felt about it or going on vacations with family, how happy that made us feel. And that was probably the most joyous times for many people because they didn't have that self-contentment because it wasn't around them in their family unit. And that is what they looked forward to. And I I told my parents, I said, you know what? We're not doing Mother's Day, Father's Day. We're not doing Easter baskets when I have kids. I'm not doing any of that stuff because I don't like what it teaches them. I don't like that it teaches them that on this day of the month, on this special designated day, this is when you feel obligated to get someone something and people get so stressed out. Like, what should I get them for this holiday? And my husband and I, we don't, we don't celebrate our anniversary. We don't, I mean, we wish each other happy. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. It's why you do it. Mm -hmm. It's the why. And we celebrate each other every day. So we don't feel like we have to do it on that day. Totally. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think, I think that's a, a huge point that you're making and it really goes for, um, material resources, money, but all sorts of other things too, like, um, relationships and mm -hmm, respect mm -hmm. and recognition, Mm -hmm. um, and our sense of achievement. It's, It's really anytime you're reaching outside of yourself, Um, I think you are, um, you're, you're kind of taking a nosedive energetically because you're going out on a limb 
um, and you're, you're giving a little bit of your power away because um, when you do get to a point where you've, you've done your work, you've spent a ton of time with yourself, um, you've checked in, you have figured out what you need and you have given yourself those things, um, then you are able to just kind of walk around and go, um, I don't care about those things so yeah. much. You know, I think um, for me, money is an awesome tool for, you know, being generous. It's a great mm-hmm. tool for um, amplifying the, the pleasurable experiences in my life. So I will, right. I will spend big money on like a pair of hiking boots or um, I spend a lot of money on writing supplies because hiking and writing are really, really important to me from a creative standpoint. And those are the things that allow me to enjoy my life. Celebrating with people is really important to me. I love to entertain. So spending money on my outdoor spaces is more important to me than going out and buying a newer, nicer car, for instance. Exactly. Exactly. While you were saying that, I was kind of multitasking, not going to lie. I heard everything you were saying, but there was one thing you said that triggered the lyrics to a song in me talking about, you're talking about relationships, right? And what we want in relationships. And I think we try to um, turn our relationships into what I call like the Disney, like the prince and the princess and for it to be perfect. And I really don't care if this is really how our relationship is. Just love me and tell me to my face, all of these things and do these things for me to show me that you love me, you know, Valentine's day, we better be doing something special (laughs) because if we don't, you don't love me. And now I need to post this on my social media. And it's, it's that outward display of showing others, like, see, I'm, I'm proving to you or I'm proving to myself that this person cares because I'm showing you all the data, right? If we have to show people stuff like that, then there's something not right. I remember that from my other relationships. I always felt the need to present how good my relationship was mm-hmm. when in the back, it was, it was awful. And so that just triggered something in me that I wanted to share. So I don't know if you know that song. Um, let me, I'm trying to find the tab now where I had it open. Oh, and who sings it? I'm terrible with names. Uh, Sasha, Sasha Sloan. Um, and the name of the song is Lie. Have you ever heard of it? Nope. I will look it up. So pretty much she says, please just fake it and look at me when I'm naked and promise me that you want this and say you're lucky and say you're lucky to love me. And that's literally the lyrics. She's pretty much saying, I don't care how you really feel. I want you to pretend that you like the way I look when I'm naked. I want you to pretend that you love me. Tell me that, tell me that you love me, even if it's not the truth. I'm just like, how backwards is this? And that's another thing is the lyrics to some of the songs. If we really listen to some of these songs that we, we play and sing to, don't you think at a subconscious level that we're, we're again, telling ourselves like that this is the standard, that this is the norm? Oh yeah. I mean, music is a a type of thing that we consume. Um, And I'm, you know, when I teach Pilates classes, I'm very mindful of that. You know, of course I'm looking for something up tempo and fun Um, and kind of dancey, but I always want, um, you know, an empowering message Mm -hmm. and empowering energy behind it, because there are so many things um, in music that do kind of uh, send a not so empowered message. And those things totally get in your head, like the things that you see in passing or the things that you hear in passing that you're not paying close attention to, those things are going straight into your subconscious exactly. mind yeah. and, and re- reinforcing um, whatever negative message is already there. So Exactly. And that's why as much as we may want to listen to really sad love songs, if we break up with someone, that's probably the worst thing that we can do because we're just self, self-loathing and making ourselves feel worse about it. And I think the way we view breakups is also a negative thing. Mm. You know, um, I think of relationships like 
the perfect shoe, you know, until you have fully grown into yourself, it's always going to be changing your shoe size. Your shoes are going to be changing until you have fully grown into yourself. And only then can you find the size for you. That's always going to fit you. Yeah. That's, but until that's then it's going to be changing. Analogy. Yeah. So we shouldn't, you know, dwell on it. We shouldn't feel like we've lost something. We should just see we're graduating into a higher self, a higher person to be with. Hopefully, hopefully <laughs> we don't downgrade. <clears throat> hopefully we don't try to cram our foot into a smaller size. Than <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think, I think it's important to acknowledge too. Um, you know, I try to be mindful of like uh, what I call spiritual snobbery. Of like, oh, well, I've, I've done my work, but she hasn't really done her work yet. Or, oh, I used to be like that. You know, um, there's always another level. There's always another layer. Um, and I totally used to be that uh, jealous, insecure girlfriend who needed mm-hmm. to um, who needed to have a showy Valentine's Day dinner and uh, post on social media so people could see how loved I am. And it really is. Um, you know, you're in every single area of your life, your external reality is a printout of the way that you feel about yourself. So if you're not feeling like people are taking you seriously, there's a really good chance that you're not taking yourself very seriously. Exactly. Um, If you feel like people aren't respecting you, there's a really good chance you're not respecting yourself fully. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is all, everything around us is a mirror, um, you know, emotionally, mentally, physically, financially. Uh, so I think it's really important to ask yourself, why do you want this thing? Mm-hmm. Well, I want to start a business. Why do you want to start a business? So my family will stop telling me to get a real job, <laughs> 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 right? Or whatever. Um, yeah. I need to go shopping today. Why do you want to go shopping today? Well, because I got invited to a party and I want to make sure that everybody sees me in a new outfit. Was that really for you or is that for them? Right. Mm -hmm. So the why and and the the root intention behind what you do, not just throughout your life, but what you do throughout your day. Right. Let's just start there. I think that goes back to don't try to eat the whole elephant in one sitting. Um, What is your intention for the things that you're doing today? And why do you want to do those things? Hopefully you're, you're wanting to do those things because those things feel good in some way. Right. And that was another conversation that you and I discussed was intention. And you were talking about some, you noticed when things weren't going very well for you in life, that it was your intention that was holding you back. Can you talk about that? Because I want to learn more about that because to your point before, before you dive in, cause I know I'll forget this when you're saying about the reflection to one thing that I'm still working on that I see in me is judgment. I am a judger. I'm aware that I'm a judger. I know that I shouldn't be judging certain people or certain circumstances And I correct for that. That's the thing about emotional intelligence is you know how to correct for that and bring awareness to why it's happening. And I know that that is because I judge myself still. And that's something I need to take care of. But it's something that I'm working on. So then I think of what intention do I have behind certain things that I'm doing? And is that why things aren't working out for me? So I'm super excited for you to share more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, when I started on my, my self-work journey a couple years ago, I think when you first get into it, it's all about your mindset, right? Mm-hmm. I'm working on my mindset or I'm reading these books about mindset. I'm taking this course about uh, business mindset or success mindset or money mindset, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but it goes so much deeper than that. And I really, um, intention is one of the the deeper layers that I uncovered doing the self-work, which, you know, again, in a nutshell, is why do you want something? Why are you doing something? Why do you have a certain goal? Um, Mm -hmm. Why do you feel a certain way? 
both when things go well and when things go badly. (laughs) So why, why, why? And, and I think the way that you and I talked about it last time and the analogy that I use is your intention is like a roller coaster track. Mm -hmm. So the track gets built first, right? And it's, Uh, The outcome of where the roller coaster ends is predetermined Um, and and your actions are like a roller coaster cart. So your actions just follow the track, right? They just end up wherever the track is designed to end. Mm -hmm. So if your intention is I need to buy a new dress because I want to impress my friends this weekend, um, it doesn't really matter Um, what kind of actions you take, right? Because the end result is you're still worried about impressing your friends instead of, damn, I look good in this dress, (laughs) right? Two completely different motivations. And I think judgment is one of those little flags that pops up when we feel ourselves judging other people. uh, It is a little flag letting us know Uh, This is one of the things that is causing you to judge yourself. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is indicative of your real intention, your real motivation behind things. I know when I first kind of started learning about judgment and noticing it, um, I was judgy about people's body my own included, right? Because if you're doing it to somebody else, you're doing it to yourself. Yep, exactly. Um, So body shape and size. Um, And the other way that I was doing it, that I caught myself doing it many times was um, how much money does someone have? Mm -hmm. What kind of car do they drive? What kind of house do they live in? What kind of clothes do they wear? How wealthy do they appear to be? And I realized that... um, both of those areas of judgment were incongruent with who I wish to be as a person. Um, I am a Pilates instructor. I do not work with perfect bodies. I do not have a perfect body. Um, I got into Pilates because I waited tables for a really long time and I needed to have a strong core and a strong back. Um, So it was all about feeling strong and being able to do physical work. Um, So I absolutely don't want to show up to a Pilates class and be judging the way somebody looks in their leggings or whatever, right? I don't want to be that person. So I had to catch myself doing it and then realize I'm doing this to myself and I'm doing it to everyone around me. Mm -hmm. Um, And you cannot make stellar, sustainable, long-term progress if you have a bunch of judgy hangups, right? Because when you're, um, we hear and see ourselves judging other people, but at our core, we are judging and criticizing ourselves, putting ourselves down, blaming ourselves, thinking negative things about ourselves. Um, and, and that's part of your roller coaster track. That's mm-hmm. part of what you're going to keep manifesting if you have those hangups and you don't stop and notice them and then try to start correcting them and thinking, okay, well, how is a different way that I could think and feel more positively about this? Yeah. And I think an important part of that too, is not tricking yourself prematurely into thinking you don't believe that way. That is another huge hang up. And one thing that I love about developing my emotional intelligence is that when I notice that stuff, like before I would try to dismiss it and reject it, it's like, no, I don't think that way. Like I would never, (laughs) right? Because it felt bad to say I'm a judgmental person, but now I don't, like, I don't feel good about it. I don't say, hey, I'm a judgmental person, (laughs) but I say, oh, wow, okay, I'm judging right now. Why am I judging? And it excites me because I feel open enough and secure enough in myself to explore the why behind that. And I know that is what's going to get me to that next level of self-development. So I want to encourage anyone who's listening, who feels bad about coming to that realization of your current areas for growth, that it's okay. 
you have to acknowledge it to get to that next level. And that's where that self-compassion comes into play. Um, it's not about critiquing yourself, which is also something that has been instilled in us from a young age, right? Not to make mistakes, not to see ourselves in a negative light, to only showcase our best self. But real self-growth is being able to see ourselves raw in the real and really be authentic and not that facade of authenticity that we see today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, I think, you know, uh, we all have judgments about certain things. So, you know, I, sometimes I see people saying, uh, well, I know I'm judging myself around this and I know I'm judging other people around this. Um, you know, uh, like you said, just wanting to switch it off mm -hmm. and saying, uh, this is bad. And I think for me, a really helpful thing is to just adopt a more stoic, uh, perspective and think, well, this is neither good nor bad, but this is judgment. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is part of who I am being as a person and I am 100% okay with all the good and bad things that make me up as a person. Um, so this is part of me and this is an area that I would like to improve, um, but not saying, oh, I'm, I'm being judgy. Um, that's bad. This is yeah. bad. Don't be judgy. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's an opportunity for improvement, but don't yeah. harp on yourself because you're, you're judging either. Right. And, and another good point that you bring up about the whole good or bad, because we also like to see things as being polarized. You're either this or you're that, or it's right or it's wrong, or it's good or it's bad. When nothing is inherently good or bad, it just is. And it is either serving you or it's not serving you. It's either in harmony with your beliefs or it is harming yourself. It is painful or it is pleasurable. And I think if we all switch that, instead of the labels, we would all be in a much more enlightened and better place because it would eliminate a lot of the judgment that comes with those labels, right? And open that area for observation, that objective view. Absolutely, definitely. So Grace, uh, we are, wow, that hour flew by. <laughs> And before you go, I obviously want you to talk a little bit about your own business and what you do and how people can find you. And again, all of your information, I'll be sure to put in the show notes, but yeah, I would love for you to tell everyone about your business. Cool. So, um, I am a confidence coach. Um, I work primarily with women, um, many of whom are entrepreneurs, um, and I really, take sort of a holistic approach to what confidence means. Um, I really like to include the, the physical, the mental mindset part of things, but then also the emotional and the energetic. Um, we all have energy and we all have things that we do every day, uh, but I think people underestimate or sometimes are just not aware of the different types of energy. Um, and I guess the simplest way for me to explain that is, are you putting regular gas or premium in your car <laughs> every day? Um, because if you are taking care of yourself across those different levels, mm -hmm. not just physically, um, but mentally, emotionally, and energetically, um, you can feel amazing. First off, that's the best benefit. And you can achieve things that you never in a million years thought that you would dare to do. Mm -hmm. And so um, bringing out people's boldness um, is my favorite part of being a confidence coach. Um, because of my name change, I am revamping my domain and my website, um, but I am on Facebook uh, my, uh, my Facebook handle is Grace Ellen Johnston. Um, and that's my little coaching page. So people can find me there. Um, but I, uh, I love to work with people, um, in a natural setting. So 
you know, if we are not in the same location, I like to have um, walking meetings or hiking meetings uh, with my Charlotte clients. I actually take them hiking in the forest. That's awesome. Um, and we do really, really deep work. I have a super strong connection to nature and I really love to bring that into my coaching practice. And it really, um, I think nature has an inherent way to make us feel safe, supported and protected, mm -hmm. um, which is why I love coaching in those natural environments. I think that's fantastic. That is awesome. Well, Grace, it has been a pleasure speaking with you today. And again, listeners, you can find more information about her. I will update it as well. Once you get your uh, new domain, yep. I can go back in the show notes and update that. So listeners uh, check back in a few months and that should be there whenever it's ready <laughs> weeks. Okay. Weeks. Then we'll be good to go. Awesome. Well, thank you again. It was a pleasure and uh, yeah. Thank Thanks, you Grace. so much for having me today. I really enjoyed it. Um, what a great conversation. Um, and I yes. absolutely love what you do. So keep up the good work. Likewise. Thank you so much. Thank you.